It's a real pleasure to be with you today. I'm honored to come and find such a great uh, audience. I love economic development, and I have a passion for entrepreneurship. I love mentoring young entrepreneurs who are full of energy and excitement. They have a spirit of adventure as they take on their business opportunities in front of them. Some of us are, tend to be a little older. We sometimes get a little comfortable in our roles and in our assignments. And so today I'd like to talk about the adventure-driven approach. To me, this is a model or a philosophy about how we approach life, how we approach our, our relationships, and how we approach our jobs here in economic development and other things. Helen Keller said, life is a daring adventure or nothing. It's this philosophy. As far as I know, she didn't climb any great mountains. She didn't cross any oceans. But she had a spirit of stepping outside her comfort zone, of taking risks and solving problems, and then becoming a great advocate and uh, uh, inf inspiration to a lot of people as they overcame their challenges. The other key to stepping out of our status quo is to create a vision. I first saw Everest in 2005 on a business trip in India. I flew up to Nepal, got a chance to fly around Everest, and it looked so big and so massive. I couldn't even conceptualize how I could possibly begin to climb it. That seed planted in my heart and in my soul, and all of a sudden, I started to put myself in that picture. And I started to ask myself, well, what's my Everest? And how can I take a look about where I could go uh, with this grand adventure? Within five years, I was on the summit, and I'm going to tell you about that story. But as you think about your Everest, where you want to go in your community or in your business, I'd like you to think about this from Tennessee's perspective and also locally. Three stories come to mind. The first one is in the southeast desert of Utah, a little town called Moab. Moab set out to say, how can we be relevant as an economic engine, as a tourist destination, and what do we have as a strategic asset? Well, they have desert and they have rocks. They have a national park not too far away. They have the Colorado River. But somehow, Moab convinced the world that their rocks are better for mountain biking than anybody else's rocks. And as a result, there are now 20 bike shops in Moab supporting a huge industry of an ecosystem and a cluster. And just as you all have an automotive focus, a music focus here in Nashville, those clusters can come into any community. The next example I'd like to give you is a little town called Cedar City. Cedar City is in the southwest part of Utah. They don't have a ton going for them. They have a little bit of rail connectivity, but it's too hard, far away to be a transportation hub. You wouldn't be thinking of Cedar City as a place to recruit businesses to. They're a little bit off the map. What Cedar City decided to do was to create a Shakespeare festival. So for, uh, this, during the summer every year, uh, they started very small. First it started as a, a week or two long program, and then it built up to the whole summer. They built this, the, the uh, theaters, and they started to build and invest in this core expertise. This didn't come from state grants. It didn't come from outside influences. It was just Mayor, Mayor Jerry Sherritt thinking about how could they bring tourist dollars into their area. Now they're the leading Shakespeare festival in the country. They bring in 80 or 100 million dollars uh, every summer, and it's a great boom for the area. The third one is a little town called Ogden, Utah, that saw its prime probably in the 50s with the railroads. Not much has happened in Ogden until just recently when Mayor Matthew Godfrey, who's only 27 years old, decided he wanted to take uh, some initiative. And he thought about what strategic assets they had. Well, 
Not too far away was a ski resort. <clears throat> and they thought, you know, we have a lot of young people coming into the mountains, and maybe we could, we could start putting together a little sports center, so a little sports complex downtown. And they'd have a climbing gym and a few other uh, sports-related activities. Well, they got the company Solomon that makes skis to sponsor that. And then they soon started to think about how they could bring other sports equipment related uh, uh, industries and companies into that little area. And Jer um, Math um, uh, Matthew went all over the place talking to businesses about why Ogden, Utah was a compelling place to relocate. And he built a number of companies uh, and a huge ecosystem. And now, just the way we think of California Pacific uh, beachwear as a trend, uh, Southern Cal as a, as a trendy spot, winter sports and equipment manufacturers all come to find the latest trends in winter apparel. And that's become a huge asset for Utah as we think about those uh, economic engines. So maybe you're thinking about how do you get started? <clears throat> when I moved to Utah, I didn't know anything about mountain climbing. I had to learn. I had to think about the opportunities that were in front of me. And so it was a great to begin climbing in the mountains and learn how to ice climb and get comfortable in something that was completely outside my comfort zone. I then went on to climb Denali, the highest mountain in the United or the North America. And this was the first full-on mountaineering expedition for me. And I started to see that it wasn't just about being physically ready, as these six of us uh, got started, and we had to uh, haul 50-pound uh, sleds up to 14,000 feet. But that as the cold set in, and we realized it was minus 40, and the wind was blowing, and we got stuck in a storm at 17,000 feet for six days without being able to go up or come down and riding that out. Everybody but my good friend Steve and I uh, dropped out. We made it to the summit and I realized that there was real lessons from the guys that didn't make it. They didn't manage the uncertainty and the ambiguity of the situation. They tried to force their way up a particular path to their objective rather than adapting to the situation and finding the weaknesses or the ways to go forward as you work your way up the rock. Just like economic development, we have to find the right path forward. It isn't always one recipe everywhere. We have to think about what works for us. Within five months of this photo, Steve had a heart attack and died riding his bicycle at age 46. But it was his idea that I go on and climb the seven summits. And so I set off to do that. Here I am in a country of Nepal getting ready to climb Everest. It's kind of a wild and crazy place. This is their idea of a milk truck. Entrepreneurs everywhere around the world in very poor countries bootstrap their businesses. They don't get any grants. They don't get outside stimulus money. They just go make it happen through hard work. As you hike into the backcountry in Nepal, you realize two things. We think of fertile farmland here in Tennessee. This is their idea of a fertile farm and terraced farming in very poor soil. <clears throat> The other thing you don't see are roads. There is no infrastructure, which is one of the things that makes Nepal very poor. This is their I-40, their Route 40, as their main superhighway. Everything going down that highway goes in on somebody's back, or it goes in on a yak or a mule. That porter right there makes a dollar a day, or $400 a year. And so the idea of investing in these uh, infrastructure projects becomes super important to up the society's ability to do commerce and to go forward. Here, unfortunately, are two girls in the middle of the day when we think kids should be in school, age 10 and 12, who are beginning to carry loads up the mountain as part of their uh, supporting their family. These are. Bridges, because there are no roads, it's hard to go from one community to the other to promote commerce. So the United Nations built these bridges to try to in promote trade. 
And as I think about these bridges and what they do, I'm quickly reminded of the whole broadband and the importance of broadband in rural communities and our need to fund this to connect these people together so that they can participate in commerce or interstate or global commerce through the internet. The other thing that we learn quickly as we trek into base camp is that hard is good. This is our family motto. Many people today in society want a comfortable, easy route. And I submit that the hard work and accomplishment and the, the sense of achievement is a greater joy than the sense of sitting on the couch. This man's probably got maybe 175, 200 pounds on his back. In the upper right, you'll see a great entrepreneur. He's a very wealthy man. He's got five yaks to his name. And yet, look at the load he's still carrying. So it never gets easier. Once you're in base camp, the next goal is to get through the obstacles, to overcome all the challenges of climbing Everest. I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Everest. This is uh, the Khumbu Icefall. And this moves up to 15 feet a day. Uh, these are huge blocks of ice that you have to work through as you work your way up the mountain. Once you get through some of the blocks of ice, you then have to cross the crevasses. And I've got six pound boots on and crampons, the wind's blowing 10 or 20 miles an hour, and I have to get through all of these ladders and look down 200 feet uh, into the crevasse. And if you guys have ever climbed up the aluminum ladders in your garage, you know just getting on your roof gets a little wobbly. Well, here are five aluminum ladders lashed together getting across one of the bigger crevasses. And as you can see, you step on your right foot and it twists right. And anyway, that's the game of getting just to Camp 2. From Camp 2, which you're, now you've left the comforts of base camp behind, and you're eating like canned sardines, and you're uh, struggling with the altitude, and you're, uh, you look up and you still see just how far you have to go. And it seems insurmountable. It's like the drive to 55. How are you going to get there? <laughs> but it's doable. You look up, and the next challenge is the Lhotse face. To give you an idea just how big this is, <clears throat> I'm going to zoom in three times on that center section. And you can just make out a few little dots of climbers working their way up the Lhotse face. And we go up and down this number of times trying to acclimatize. And uh, Camp 3 is at 25,000 feet. And there I am working my way up to Camp 3. And you can see in the right side just how steep that becomes. Storms would come in. We had a number of storms. In fact, we got to 25,000 feet thinking we'd go to, for the summit. 80 mile an hour winds came in, wiped the tents out. We had to go all the way back down to the bottom and start over. And the idea of missing a, a business recruitment or not uh, dealing with disappointment as we go through uh, challenges in economic development become huge. There's Camp 3 looking out over the valley. And still, you don't even begin to see Everest until you get to Camp 4 at 26,000 feet. So for 45 days, we were climbing. And the lesson there is to remember to focus on the summit, even if we can't see it every day as we go through our day-to-day -day jobs. But just like anything, you break it down into pieces. And you break each one of these goals and sub-goals down into rope lengths. And each rope length, which may be as long as this podium, you break down into steps. And slowly, you work your way up and get towards the top. Here I am in my oxygen mask. You know, in the movie Everest, everybody had their goggles up, their oxygen mask off to the side, um, their jackets open. In real life, uh, I got to tell you, your skin would freeze and fall off. So uh, that's why we cover up. If you don't think it's cold on Everest, there's our Nikon camera. But here I am approaching the Hillary step. And to the, my right, uh, is 10,000 foot drop. Below my feet, which are on these little snow steps, is a 6,000 foot drop. 
and I'm thinking, how am I going to get up the Hillary step? <clears throat> Fortunately, even in spite of the oxygen regulator and the three pairs of gloves and the over mitts, uh, I, I was able to make it up. The other thing is about teamwork. I had a Sherpa help me know which line of all the lines up there to choose. And as we think about how we need to come together as a team, leveraging the resources around us, every one of my successes have all been about enabling a team to come together, a support system. Here I am approaching the summit. You can see I'm hunched over. I'm hyperventilating. <sighs> just trying to take a step. That guy in red got to the summit, sat down, couldn't get up. <clears throat> I got to the top. We took the celebratory photo, and then I had to make a political statement. And so I planted a Utah Valley University flag on the summit of Everest because I wanted the students to know that a college education will take them anywhere they want to go in life and to focus on completing their education. I applaud every one of you in the state of Tennessee for having this Tennessee promise and for enabling uh, kids to go through an applied technical college, a community college, and to go through two years of school, but to all of a sudden extend that pathway for them about their personal vision for what education means for them and how it will change their lives. And to all of you who are mentors in that program, how I hats off to you. That is incredible and in how you will change their lives. So there's the summit of Everest. You're looking out over Tibet and you realize, wow, that's a pretty cool view. But that's not the end of the journey. You have to get down and most of the accidents happen on the way down. The next thing to remember is that there are more adventures behind you. Here I am on the summit of Mount Elbrus in the Caucasus of Russia, and our team is celebrating. Wow, we just climbed another summit of the seven summits. But what's interesting about that <clears throat> is that on the way down, the guy on the left in blue was the coach of the Russian Climbing Federation. And as he led us, he wasn't roped up like the rest of us, and I watched him just disappear and he fell 40 feet down into a crevasse and wedged himself in the bottom of the crevasse. And so for the next three hours, we worked to pull him out and to figure out how to get him unwedged and to get him up. And we finally got him up. He said, fifth time fallen crevasse. <laughs> <laughs> now, <clears throat> there's something about roping up for safety that maybe didn't get across. But what I want to tell you about today is the lesson of the team. The team that celebrated at the summit and the team that knew how we saved somebody's life and came together to make that happen were two entirely different teams. Not everybody was able to participate fully. Some of them got really cold and hunkered down. But when you realize that you came through a trial together, that you worked and put it all out there to make something come together, those are the teams that form for life, where you tr that trust and that dynamic of what we want out of Team Tennessee can really come together. Another thing I learned, climbing in Indonesia, this is in West Papua, Kartens Pyramid, is that you have to manage risk. You have to look at these situations as challenges in and of themselves. This is a Tyrolean traverse to get over to the mountain ridge line where we have to ascend up towards the summit. I was, here I am, I'm a little nervous as I'm looking down hundreds and hundreds of feet, and yet I knew I had to get across. As we think about dealing with uh, political dynamics, people often get risk adverse. They're not anxious to take anything where they could, or do anything initiative-wise where they could get a black eye, or where they have to lead without some of the consensus giving them the security that the whole group is, is with them, behind them. As leaders in economic development, I hope each of you will blaze a trail and take those risks 
move out in front of your peers and then build the coalition behind you. But if you have that vision and knowing where to go and then engage them in the process, you will find much more advancement in your particular part of the state. Another thing you have to do is learn how to creatively solve problems. Here we are in Antarctica, winds blow off the uh, Antarctic plateau, come in pretty strong, and so we had to build these wind walls. But why not do it in a way that was a little fun and creative? Having the creativity to the problem solving is a great way to engage people and to not make them feel like they have to uh, work and it's all just an endless uh, series of problems. Also, we need to enjoy the moments. Here I am on the peak in Antarctica, enjoying my seventh summit, and just taking a special moment about what and how I got there, and how important and what a priceless memory that is to me. I hope as we enable others economically that we think about the joy of that experience and how we are changing lives and making opportunities for them that they may not have had otherwise. While I was down there, I also cross-country skied to the South Pole, and I'm the third guy here in yellow. And to give you an idea of what the headwinds were like, I'll play a quick clip here. We uh, skied for 70 miles to get there, but we got to the South Pole and we celebrated. But during that, I realized I had a family, another team back home. And my wife, Kim, and my daughter, Lily, and particularly with Lily's handicap of being completely disabled, we realized we wanted another adventure. And so we ended up thinking about sailing as a way that we could balance my need for adventure and still take our daughter, Lily. So off we did, uh, off we go to on what my wife thought was a beautiful Caribbean cruise. <laughs> We did have a few palm trees and lovely pretty islands, but we had to also get up our courage, particularly for my wife, to sail across the Pacific Ocean, 8,000 miles, sometimes 1,500 miles from land. We went to Panama and we realized a lot of people were stuck in Panama. They couldn't get launched, and so we had this simple goal of just go sail across the ocean. Here's the Panama Canal, and it was a lot of fun to go through, and certainly a key milestone in the journey. We got to the Galapagos. We had fun playing with sea lions that came on the boat every day and stocking provisions for the long journey ahead. I caught a 400-pound black marlin. <clears throat> it took me five and a half hours to reel in, and I loved every minute of it. And yet my wife, was seasick the whole time. Because as the boat stopped, it just rolled in the waves. And so it was a great lesson to me to be empathetic to all the members of the team and to make sure everybody sees the situation the same way. We also got to visit beautiful places in the Marquesas and to visit island uh, tropical uh, paradises but to also see communities that only have fish and coconuts as the basis of their economy. And particularly to see their spirit and the opportunity they have to give and be selfless and how in spite of their economic situation, culturally, they are such a warm and friendly people. And yet how do we help them economically and some of the things that go on? We also had to deal with uncertainty, and here I am diving with sharks. Apologize for the music. <clears throat> but hundreds and hundreds of sharks that could have quickly turned into a feeding frenzy. And so I had to take on my own sense of uncertainty and wrestle through that. Um, we obviously got to visit deserted beaches and uh, have great cultural experiences. All of that came together for us because we applied that sense of adventure. You all have seen the movie Finding Nemo. Well, here's a clownfish. And visiting the underwater neighbors, and manta rays, and uh, humpback whales, all became part of my 
love of this experience and, and taking this adventure and some of the joys I had from there. The other thing that adventure and being adventure driven teaches us is this fact that we are more capable than we realize. Here's a humpback whale breaching right next to my wife, Kim. When we started, her idea of snorkeling was maybe two life jackets, three feet of water, and little tiny fish. Her brother drowned in a Boy Scouting accident. For her, the ocean was big and dangerous. But the transformation that came over her as she embraced this opportunity of adventure was a, tr a wonderful transformation. And then we had a great celebration as we arrived in Australia. I went on to uh, uh, hit Komodo Island and the Komodo Dragons to swim with whale sharks under the ocean and to have a great sense of, of where we went. From there, I sailed through the Southern Ocean and I did it to learn from those who've gone before. I studied uh, Brigham Young's colonization of the West when I ran economic development to model after him and to learn what he accomplished and how he managed to really make this desert blossom as a rose. And I wanted to learn what the old sailors knew, the guys like Shackleton and, and Amundsen as he went and became the first guy to sail through the Northwest Passage. So I signed on to this old sailing ship, and I had to learn all those ropes. And here I am working 80 feet off the deck in the, in the moving seas, uh, furling sails. And, but I got to see Antarctica again from the shoreline and to visit the neighbors down there. <clears throat> I also had leadership challenges as I sailed from Alaska, from Dutch Harbor, on up over Alaska through northern Canada and down through Greenland. We struggled <clears throat> with team dynamics and a dysfunctional team and having to accomplish the goal in spite of that. We had to work our way through the pack ice and the cold, wet, damp days and fog and work our way past icebergs as we uh, wended our way uh, through the north. For my final adventure, I chose to sail across the North Pacific as part of a race from Jindao, China, which is west of, of uh, South Korea, to Seattle on a boat called Visit Seattle. And this race was where you're on watch four hours and off watch four hours, and you have to make this boat go through some tremendous storms. We had waves 40 feet high, wind gusts 120 miles an hour, and in spite of waves coming at me from two directions, I still had a smile on my face. And so I realized that although there will be storms in our careers and challenges that we have to face, our attitude is more important than the severity of the storm. You can see the worn, tired look on my face as I'm continuing to battle the elements and fight the cold and being constantly wet for 29 days. But the other thing we learned is that in spite of these giant waves coming up behind us, that we could turn our 70-foot sailboat, which weighed 33 tons, into a surfboard. And we could catch a wave and go 40 miles an hour. And that riding those waves was a great opportunity. In my career, I caught several waves. I caught the defense industry during the Reagan years. I caught the internet in the 90s. And both of those launched me forward. We need to look out into the economic uh, opportunities and to think about what are the waves we want to catch, both locally and as a state. What are those core focus areas we want to focus on? We can't do everything. So that means we have to pick and choose winners and core technologies or core areas for us to focus on in order to be successful. Here's a video of what it's like as a team and how our team had to come together on, a sa on the sailboat. As we started, you'll see our, our bowsprit also broke off. So we started at 70 feet and we ended at Seattle at 65 feet. And you'll see me in the bow in red uh, during the journey. Can we turn it up a little bit? 
That's our galley. Next time you're in an uh, economic development team meeting, um, think about how teams come together and uh, you were warm, you're still warm and cozy even if it's a long meeting. <clears throat> obviously, we celebrate team success. And obviously, Team Tennessee has a lot to be proud of. You've accomplished amazing things the last uh, year. I'm really impressed, 20 plus thousand jobs, great new opportunities, alignment around core initiatives. Uh, Governor Haslam, Randy Boyd have set out a wonderful vision for where you're going with economic development. How will we look and engage in this process in the future? And how will we participate as we drive and carry out that vision in our communities and in our different areas around the state? One of the things that helps us to think about those team dynamics is to view and think about what your team, and when I talk about your team, it's not just people who work for you. It's the collective group of people you interact with, particularly you who work in areas where you might have a commission or a board of directors or areas and groups that may be particularly locked in a, in a, in a bit of a a status or stasis and not so comfortable trying out new things or following your vision. Try to think about what they see and uh, think about it from these three common issues that teams face. Number one is they cannot see the vision. They can't quite get there in terms of where this is all going and their comfort zone is limited by how far they can see. Well, you can't promise them a sunny, perfect vision, but what you can do is give them reference points. A little bit further view. As we sail down around the coast of Africa, we couldn't see at all. And as we sail down along the coast of Greenland, complete uh, fogged in, and yet we had these icebergs showing up on the radar screens. If you can see a little bit of the sun know that that's good enough for a team to go forward and march forward, but you have to give them something to work with. Another common issue teams face is all they see is obstacles. They can't get past all the things that are in the way, 
all the reasons why something can't be done. Our job as leaders is to come in and show them how to weave through uh, the obstacles and to show that that momentum can come together and that you can make forward headway. As it may be slow and it may be a challenge um, to work those issues and to gain momentum behind each of these initiatives, but it'll come and keep at it and you will uh, uh, wend your way forward. Other teams know exactly the objective. They see exactly where they have to get to. Their challenge is to not know the best route to get there. And so we have to help lay out a path for them to be successful, to engage in a way that really enables them to come forward and to help them uh, decide, well, yes, in order to get there, we've got to do these five things first and lay the groundwork or put it together. So those, I think, are the three key elements of teams. As we also think about it, the next thing that's important is to keep challenging ourselves, both professionally but also personally. One of the things I learned in Silicon Valley is all of these great industry icons that are running these companies, all were very passionate individuals, but they all had separate individual challenges that they were taking on, and they were growing as individuals. Uh, Larry Ellison at Oracle uh, personally put $400 million into uh, um, winning the America's Cup. Obviously, e Elon Musk is doing a lot with space and pushing forward. Jeff Bezos, all of these guys are driving forward and continue to challenge themselves. I challenge each of you to create that vision, to think about where your community can go, to put together the game plan, to think about how it, you could get there, to engage all the resources needed to come together as an aligned team, and to work through the team dynamics of bringing these coalitions together. One of the things about economic development we tried to do in Utah is let everybody play in the sandbox but we had to have ways that supported each other and referral systems and engaging everybody around the common vision of where we wanted to go. And then finally, never stop and believe that you can accomplish a whole lot more than you ever thought possible. And so with that, I'd like to thank you and say, go Team Tennessee. <laughs>